Greetings from Hong Kong. Um, my name is Donald Choi. I graduated from RISD in uh, 1982 with a bachelor's degree in architecture. Uh, I have the honor of serving as the first international president of the Alumni Association, representing our 30,000 alumni worldwide. On behalf of the RISD Alumni Association and the RISD Families Association, I am delighted to welcome alumni families, students, faculty, and museum patrons to this online event. Today, I am here to offer some welcome remarks on this timely and relevant topic, digital gold, what artists should know about NFTs. In the next hour, you will hear from a panel of experts that represent different backgrounds and interests. They will help us learn about this new world of cryptocurrency. It is important to acknowledge a few things about NFTs. First, this is a global phenomenon. For example, Sophia, the creation of our own alumnus, David Hansen, created and sold the first digital artwork by a humanoid robot and sold it at auction for $688,888. The second is the environmental impact associated with NFTs, something that I know is of great interest to our alumni, students, and faculty. We will have time at the end of our panel for participants to ask their own questions during our Q&A segment and a quick reminder that, session, that this session is being recorded. I would like to now welcome Brian Drucker, Associate Editor or Non-Editor, Arts in America, who will serve as tonight's moderator. I will now invite Brian to welcome and introduce our distinguished panelists. Brian, please. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction, Donald, and thank you to the RISD Alumni Association for hosting. Um, art and NFTs is a huge topic, and I don't think we can comprehensively address it in the time we have tonight. So the panelists have put together a um, list of links that is on the event webpage. Uh, that includes everything from some basic information about how to get started and make your first NFT to some theory and history of art on the blockchain. So I hope you'll check that out. Um, and now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have um, Shepard Ferry, who is an artist and RISD alum, uh, and Amanda Trula Ferry, a creative director and uh, advocate. Uh, they recently worked together to uh, mint a work by Shepherd that raised 40000 for charity last month. Um, would you like to say a couple words to introduce yourselves? Um, sure. I'm a RISD grad, Illustration 92. I um, try to use my art to deal with a lot of, soci a lot of social causes and... Um, it's, uh, I might be known by some people for making the Obama Hope poster, which was a grassroots tool that became pretty ubiquitous during Obama's 2008 campaign. I also have a street art um, history with my Obey Giant campaign. But um, I like the way that NFTs democratize things because I think art should be in more spaces of culture. I'm Amanda Ferry, and I've been working with Shepard for 22 years, um, maybe plus, and um, basically have been, um, you know, tasked with figuring out what we are doing um, within this NFT space and within the blockchain space. We um, we have been working, um, you know, I've been helping him and working with um, the campaigns for for that many years, but then also we've been working for six years on putting all of our certificates of authenticity on the blockchain through Verisart. So we've been um, just trying to navigate our way through this space, but we are students and um, we're super excited to be on this panel with, ever, with all of these other experts. So I'm hoping to learn a lot too. 
Yeah, I think we're all still in a learning process. This is all pretty new for a lot of people. Um, next, we have Tina, Rip, uh, Tina Rivers Ryan, who is an assistant curator of modern and contemporary art at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo. Tina is joining us as a voice of dissent. She's been a vocal critic of NFTs and crypto on Twitter, and she recently um, had a essay in the current issue of Art Forum that expands on her position. Hi, Tina. Hi, Brian. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great, fantastic. Um, so uh, I'm a curator and also an art critic. And I first um, wrote about blockchain in 2016 when I reviewed Simon Denny's exhibition, Blockchain Future States, which is at Petzl Gallery. And that show was really my first introduction to not just the technology of the blockchain, but the sociology and the ideology and sort of trying to wrap my head around what exactly the space was trying to accomplish. Um, and their, their sort of attitudes about technology and politics and finance. Uh, this month, I wrote about blockchain again for Art Forum, uh, focusing on the rise of NFTs and um, specifically on what I think the NFT means for the larger field of digital art. Um, and uh, I won't, I don't think we're going to be talking too much about the issues that I raised today in the context of this particular panel. Um, but I'll just say that I, my take was sort of that, um, the a lot of what's referred to as crypto art and perhaps even the nft itself is pretty regressive when you think about um the the history of digital art and the way that digital artists have been um sort of formally innovative and um politically pretty progressive uh but i look forward to this conversation great um next up we have ann spalter who brings a variety of perspectives to the topic uh and is a collector, an artist. She's a historian who initiated the first courses on digital art at Brown and Rissi in the 90s. And for the last year, she has been actively creating and collecting art on the blockchain. Welcome, Anne. Thanks, Brian. That um, was mostly what I was going to say about myself, that I have these various hats and have been creating digital artwork now for several decades and collecting it with Michael Spalter, um, lending it to museums. And it's an honor to be on this panel with these other panelists and um, their incredible um, brains and insight into this. Uh, I think that though of all of these different hats that I wear is really as an artist that I feel most strongly about NFTs. So probably speak most from that perspective and from having shown in the traditional art world and in galleries, and then recently also um, creating NFTs and selling them. Thanks. Um, and finally, we have Anuradha Vikram, who is a writer, curator, and educator based in Los Angeles. Uh, she's been researching possible applications of the blockchain and the arts and speaking to artists and collectors about why they are drawn to this technology, uh, to NFTs, and what else, uh, what other possibilities they see. So uh, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I don't seem to be able to start my video. Oh, here I am. Great. Hi. Um, so yes, I'm happy to be here. I'm a curator. I'm a writer and a university professor based in LA. Came to NFTs through the digital art world. I was an associate producer on the 2006-01 Art and Technology Festival in San Jose. I worked with a lot of great digital artists. I've also worked with other artists interested in this space. Art, of, art and Tech, like Survival Research Labs, Cal Spelatich, Pinar Yoldis, Stephen Wilson, and Sonia Rappaport. And I've also published a lot on art and technology. So I got interested in the blockchain first around 2017, 18, when I started to understand what its implications could be for contracts, because contracts are what governs arts distribution and exchange. And because I was working first in artist studios in nonprofit commissioning institutions, and also in commercial galleries, I have a lot of experience with IP issues in the arts more broadly. And now I also teach art history classes to artists. So I talk about issues all the time around um, ownership and appropriation and you know so also I read a lot about decolonization in art markets and museums and cultural equity my book decolonizing culture covers those topics and so in the piece on nfts which I published which Brian published this morning um, I was able to talk about some of the ways that artists are using the technology but also some of the ways that the technology replicates or emulates some other strategies for financializing art or turning arts a manifestation in the world into contracts in previous art history in the 20th century. Thanks. And yeah, as Anuradha mentioned, um, we worked together on a piece for Art in America that was published this morning. Uh, it's more about how artists are using NFTs in an attempt to have more control over 
their markets. So uh, the link is on the event page, so please check it out. Um, all right, so I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I would also like the conversation to be organic among you, so you don't have to necessarily wait for me to ask questions. You can interact with each other. But um, I just wanted to start you know, um, kind of with the basics. I mean, Amanda, I liked what you said about being a student and learning. I'm really curious what, you know, you were most surprised by um, as you approached this topic. What what have you learned that you think is maybe most important for other artists to know? I, I think um, as being part of Shepard's team, what was um, surprising and really awesome is to see how tight knit this digital art NFT community is um, and sort of um, just seeing how um, how artists that don't work in that realm, for example, Shepard are 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 being embraced into it. But but most importantly, you know, I think I'm it's I'm it, it's it's the love between all of these artists that I'm really seeing. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way for us to be able to be a part of this community. And then additionally, you know, continue to support it because I'm seeing so many different things happen in the marketplace of NFTs that seem a little disingenuous to what maybe the original um, digital creators were doing when they started to do these NFTs. And so um, I, I think, you know, just seeing that camaraderie and wanting to make sure that we are keeping a pin in that so that as we go through this exploratory um, experience that we're constantly keeping that in mind, but just wanting to stick with that spirit. Um, I'm curious, Anne and Anurata, if you've had similar experiences um, and perspectives as, as, as you've explored the space. Get I, I can talk about my experience as an artist and yeah. Just and if you've also sort of observed this kind of camaraderie, uh, yeah. that um, about. I think that's one of one of the many wonderful uh, aspects of making NFTs. Um, is this great? friendly space that has occurred um, largely on Twitter. Um, it's very welcoming and it's welcoming in other ways as well because anyone can come in and put up artwork and collectors can see it. And I think it's it's difficult if you haven't tried to make a living as an artist or get recognition as an artist to understand just how different it is from the regular experience of the art world and dealing with galleries and producing shows. Um, and it's hard to even try to explain how different it is. Um, the ease with which you can get a work up in a, in a space, mint it, um, have someone see it, have a collector decide they want to purchase it, have them basically click a button and buy it, have money mysteriously appear instantly in your crypto wallet. Um, without any drama of any type whatsoever, without having to wonder if you're going to get paid late or maybe ever, um, having direct interaction with your collectors. It's, it's such a different experience than most of what goes on in the traditional art world. And I think that um, if you're not in that world, you wouldn't really know, know that or understand how different that feels. And then also getting royalties if you sell a work and it's you know sold again, that you get royalties, which sounds just like a kind of technical accounting detail. But the first time it happened to me, literally tears came into my eyes. It it was so exciting, and you realize, wow, like what the world would be a different and better place if this were happening in the regular art world all the time. And in trying to come up with some sort of metaphor um, to explain it, I think, to people that aren't in the, the bizarreness that is the regular art world all the time. It's kind of like if you've been swimming underwater and you're swimming and you're swimming and then you come up and you kind of take a deep breath of air and you it feels so great. And so, you know, there are a lot of arguments against NFTs and there are technical issues and problems and there are a lot of intellectual things you can discuss. But then there's also this incredible feeling of, wow, this is great. Like, this is such a great community. This is so easy. This makes things that were so difficult before so much easier with so much less friction. Some of these things must be, you know, adopted by the traditional art world 
one hopes, whatever happens with the technology of the blockchain. So for me as an artist, that's what's exciting about it. And, and I hope it will impact people's views of digital art. I think it already has it a positive way and that it will impact the traditional art world and help it be a better place for everyone in it. Right. Um, Anurad, I know you've spoken a lot to collectors and artists. Does uh, what you've heard sound similar to what Anna's saying? Sure. So, you know, the collectors that I spoke with are very keen on getting artists and other collectors to enter the space. They said they were particularly interested in artists who already have a track record of creation becoming NFT artists, that that has more value for them. In a way, I think it's more valuable for someone like Shepard to mint an NFT for a collector, the ones I talk to, than a Beeple, although they do also collect Beeples and artists who are more NFT native artists in that way. But they're really excited about contemporary artists of all kinds getting into this space. And I think it's important to understand Crypto is an evangelistic platform, right? I mean, in some ways you could look at it as a pyramid scheme because it also requires people to buy in. But if you want to look at it, I think in a more positive light, you'd still see it as very evangelistic in the sense that the more people get involved in the crypto space, the better, in fact, the tools are going to become, the security is going to become, the ease of use is going to become because there are more customers. It's just a fact of economies of scale. So for that reason, crypto folks are really excited about all the interest in crypto that NFT is generating. So yeah, they're very, very welcoming, super supportive of artists who want to get into the space. Um, and so I think the issues are outside of that. I think as, as Anne noted, the feel is kind of different from the contemporary art world. I would also say though, you know, I live in LA, so it's a different art world here than it is in New York. Um, it's a little bit more laid back and friendly, I think. So already that sense of camaraderie is there among artists in general. And then in the crypto space, that's also true. I also worked a lot with digital art. And I'd say that in the digital art space, there's generally a sense of welcome and camaraderie and collaboration as well, as well as a sense of experimentation because it's so often tied in with science. And so people work in teams. They work um, in kind of an iterative manner. And I think we could really look at crypto and NFTs as being iterative. This iteration, this iteration has this much potential, and then it will develop over time. It's going to become something else. I think to Anne's point about whether it's going to bring the traditional art world along, I would say yes. And here's why. Um, generally speaking, I've found that the commercial art market will follow any trend to protect itself. And that, um, for example, you know, European galleries and New York galleries opening up outposts in Los Angeles, not necessarily because they're so interested in LA collectors or that they can't reach those collectors in art fairs and other venues, but rather because their artists are moving here because it's a great place to live for artists. And then they want to make sure that they continue to represent them. I can see galleries trying to get into the NFT space for the exact same reason so that their artists do want to participate in NFTs. They make sure they're still maintaining that same relationship. In that case, I think there's still a lot of questions too. I think we'll get into this later about sort of who makes the NFT, who owns it, how does all that stuff work? It's less of an issue when you're an artist minting your own. It's more of an issue if you are working with any sort of partners or teams. So um, I think I'll leave it there, but I would say, yeah, for the most part, people are really encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about it being a sort of a, a different kind of scene than um, the fine art world. And, you know, I didn't really start writing about crypto art until a couple of months ago, but I did like check out Super Rare about a year ago and seeing the kind of work that was being shown and how people had these handles like Android Jones. I mean, I, I was thinking, oh, this is kind of like street art, but online. And so Shepard, I'm curious if you see like an analog between um, the crypto art scene and the street art world. I mean, are they uh, different in important ways or do you see more in common? Well, I, you know, I, I can, I, I've learned not to try to speak for other street artists or graffiti artists. That's a quick way to get a, at least an online beat down. But, um, <laughs> but I, um, I, I can speak for myself in that the spirit of street art for me was always about um, bypassing bureaucracy and just um, connecting with an audience in an immediate do it yourself way. And I see that spirit with NFTs. Absolutely. That, People who are shut out from the traditional art world are saying, I can mint an NFT, I can share it with an audience, I can 
I can have more of an unmediated relationship with an audience through, um, through all of this. And, you know, I, I think that's empowering for people in the same way that, that street art is. And, you know, a little bit of that, um, the, the, you know, code names and, and this and that, that's, that's fun that, you know, I, um, I don't, I don't know how I feel about all of it, but, um, anyway, it, yes, there is an analogy there, but what I'm excited about is anything that gives artists tools to control their own output, to self publish, to build a direct relationship with an audience. And, um, you know, there, there are a ton of street artists who are sought out by the galleries after they've built a resonance for their street art. And um, rather than going around to galleries and going through the t traditional, you know, um, brown nosing maneuvers and, and um, you know, getting in the door that way. Um, I love the idea that if you create the, the resonance for the work that, you know, the demand from all the traditional venues and the non-traditional venues will follow. So um, I believe in a multi-platform approach and, um, so I would never do just street art or just gallery art or just NFTs or just clothing um, or just my social media stuff. To me, it's all, all of it's important and the more the merrier. But um, but especially for artists that don't have connections in the traditional art world, uh, I think it's yeah, it is very connected to that that mentality behind street art. Mm -hmm. So we've heard a lot about how NFTs can empower artists, allow access um, in a way that, you know, the traditional artwork doesn't. But um, a lot of people have pointed out that the platforms like Nifty Gateway or Super Rare, the, there are, you know, the people who run those are getting very rich and only a few artists are getting very rich off of the NFTs and that, you know, they depend on buy-in of a lot of artists who are never going to be that successful. And um, I think that might be important to talk about. I don't know, Tina, if you want to expand on that, because I know it's something that you've discussed a lot um, online. Yeah, sure. Um, and I immediately just want to, um, I guess, preface my comments by saying that I am a big fan of artists eating. I am not against artists making money and monetizing their art. And I have a ton of respect for everybody on this panel, um, or I wouldn't be here. Um, and I also am sensitive to the fact that especially after the year that we've just had with the global pandemic, you know, it's a really bad time to demand ideological purity from anybody. Um, so I, I'm not really saying that people who are making money from NFTs should um, stop making money from NFTs. Um, I merely want to sort of emphasize that we just need to be very um, careful and nuanced uh, in our understanding of what NFTs can actually offer artists. Um, and we also need to um, maybe uh, not settle for the NFT because I do think that the, you know, the NFT is, uh, look, I'm not here to say that the art world is not problematic. The art world is certainly problematic. And I don't want to engage in whataboutism and say, well, just because the NFT doesn't solve every problem, like we shouldn't use it. Um, the art world is problematic. The NFT is being marketed as something that can solve a lot of the art world problems. It turns out that the NFT actually is replicating a lot of the art world problems and is itself problematic in other new ways. So I'm simply saying that we continue exploring other options for empowering artists um, that are beyond the NFT. So um, as far as I understand um, what NFTs are, are, are doing for artists, I, uh, and again, I'm not an artist, and Anne, I really you know, very much hear your comment about how difficult it might be for somebody who's never had to um, work on the, that other side of the equation, who's never tried to work with a gallery as an artist. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't really speak from personal experience, but um, I um, have been in these conversations, listening to artists, hanging out on Clubhouse with a lot of um, people who are in the scene and um, also uh, trying to look at the data as much as possible. And I think that for those of you, I think we linked to this um, on the event page, but for those of you who are interested more in some sort of concrete numbers, it helps me to wrap my head around things. Uh, Kimberly Parker published um, a great um, uh, review of some data that she scraped from OpenSea. Uh, and that now has also been written about in Artnet. Um, but if you just Google like Kimberly Parker Medium. Uh, so at the height of the market in the middle of March, um, she and a colleague scraped data um, from OpenSea, which is the largest uh, NFT platform and which also has some data from some of the other markets as well. 
And they tried to do as deep of a dive as they could to understand what the data actually is telling us about the nature of the market, moving beyond all of the hype. And so um, one of the things she found, and again, this was only a representative you know, sample of data, but um, one of the things she found is that basically 75% of artists are making $400 or less per NFT. So right now, all the media attention is really skewed on these extremely high value um, auctions and sales. And by the way, if you look at um, some of the market reports, like there's um, cryptoart.io, there's cryptoartpulse.com. So I look at these market reports and you can see that basically um, you know, the, the very um, upper tier, that highest echelon of people who are really making money with these things, it's a lot of the same names over and over and over again. Um, and most of those names tend to be white men. Um, uh, so, so there's not a lot of um, diversity at the top in any sense. Um, but then if you look at the sort of the rest of the field, right, that basically about 75 artists are making $400 or less. Um, most of those artists are not seeing resales. So to Anne's point about the, um, the, the amazing opportunity to, to have resale, um, royalties and rights, a hundred percent, we should have those. I hope that actually we can push Congress to make that a federally protected right. Um, but in the absence of that, those resale rights are pretty tenuous. They rely upon, um, somebody not taking your NFT out of that particular market because those resale rights, I just want to be clear on this, at this point in time, do not transfer between platforms. They're not baked into the NFT. They're granted by the terms and conditions of each individual platform. So they're pretty easy to circumvent. Um, and you shouldn't really think of them as being granted sort of like in perpetuity. Um, but anyway, um, and they're only like 10%, which like, again, better than better than nothing. I just think we need to be clear about what exactly is being brought to the table. So anyway, um, uh, it seems that um, judging, you know, on this sample of data that um, something like uh, 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 two thirds of NFTs that are sold are, have not yet been resold. And I don't want to harp on that too much because the market's young and that could change. We could start to see more churning in the secondary market. But at this point right now, it is statistically accurate to say, it seems, at least for this sample of data, that most artists are not seeing resale sales, uh, resales um, income right now. Um, one other thing I thought was super fascinating that Kim Parker pointed out is that um, the fees on minting NFTs, on doing the transactions with the network can be so high that unless you are clearing and getting a lot more money, you could lose your income to fees. So. Um, you know, the, 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 the biggest group of people selling NFTs are the people who sell it for $100 or less, but the average fees for that amount are 100.5%, meaning that if you sold your NFT for $100, on average, you owed 50 cents on that transaction and actually earned nothing. So um, I'm not saying it's not true that people are making money and doing well. And it's amazing that, you know, um, Shepard and Amanda were able to raise money for Amnesty International, which is a like, cause that's very close to my heart. And I'm glad that Anne is doing so well. But um, I just think we need some sort of transparency about statistically what's actually going on with this market. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, 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 you know, uh, Parker concludes that basically it's not quite the democratizing force that it's being advertised as. Yeah, I was struck by something Anurata said that collectors who are buying NFTs are primarily interested in work by artists who already have a market because that's like more of a guarantee of value. So I, I don't um, even. Yeah, it, it's like not something that, you know, maybe not the best way to start practice it's something that can exist in tandem with other kinds of work um yeah i mean i think we should be clear though that um like which market are you talking about because yeah. i think it's definitely the case that there is you know a parallel art ecosystem here there are people like people who have huge followings who are very much established like they might, might not be known within the contemporary fine art world which is only one of many art worlds anyway um mm -hmm. But, you know, there are people who have huge followings and who do very well in this, even though they have no name brand recognition within, you know, the world of art in America or art form or didn't until February anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how people were talking about the Beeple sale and what Sotheby's did with Pac as, oh, the fine art world is getting into NFTs. But, um, you know, the people who bought those were primarily, you know, crypto investors, crypto evangelists and um 
it's more about, I think the auction house is finding new streams of income and finding new audiences. But yeah, Amanda, you want to say yeah. something? I think, I think that's true. I mean, I was just reading an article earlier today about how maybe it's Sotheby's, but Sotheby's or Christie's basically, you know, just, the, just the fact that they're starting to, to um, accept cryptocurrency for, for physical art. I mean, I feel like that's what the whole Beeple thing was about, in my opinion, is that it was the fact that they're accepting crypto cryptocurrency. And that's I think that was the bigger story than than the fact that that piece sold. I think that's what that group of buyers were trying to get across to the, you know, the hoi polloi that um, cryptocurrency is here and it's starting to be accepted. And I think that, you know, all of all of this. Um, not noise, but all of this excitement about NFTs, it's exciting. There's exciting artists to talk about, exciting, you know, saleable events. But um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's the use of cryptocurrency. That's the ultimate thing that's happening right now. You know, that's, that's the real thing that's going on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to discuss is the... Oh, wait, Anurada, you wanted to say Yeah, that? I just wanted to put, put a couple of, of fact checks on the Beeple sale. One thing I thought was really interesting was that I read an article that addressed the fact that some NFT folks don't actually consider the Beeple sale to be a proper NFT sale because while an NFT was minted, the auction actually took place through Christie's. And it wasn't auctioned as an NFT. The auction took place, then the NFT was minted as part of the establishment of the sale. So I actually think that's really interesting because it is a smart contract as opposed to being a bidding commodity itself in that particular case. And it's a sign of how the traditional art market will apply this technology. Um, so that was really the main thing I just wanted to add. Okay. Um one thing I wanted to talk about is the, you know, longevity of these NFTs. I mean, protocols for tokens have changed a few times since they were first introduced in, you know, 2014, 2015. I mean, um, and I'm curious, you have a collection of computer art and generative art that is um, prints of, of like iterations of generative systems that artists make, but you have uh, in the last year started collecting NFTs as part of this collection. I mean, do you think about issues of uh, preservation and how you're going to handle these things in the long term? Um, yeah, you can hear me. Uh, yes, I mean, there are definitely some unknowns. I guess when you collect uh, art made with new technology, there's always some unknowns. It takes a certain type of collector. But I have a lot of confidence that those technological issues can be addressed. I don't think they're going to be insurmountable at all. Um, and to me, especially artwork created algorithmically, um, where the algorithm is on chain and the artworks are minted on demand, like the artwork from uh, artblocks.io, to me fit with our collection so perfectly that it would be crazy for us not to be collecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seems like, uh, you know, like we have the ancestors of those works and now we need, you know, their children in our collection. And they just also appeal to me enormously visually. So, and um, maybe a little bit also like some of the pleasure of the whole process from the art side, also as a collector, unlike dealing with galleries. And this is not to put down galleries because I think galleries also have a rough time of it in the traditional art world. It's not like a lot of gallerists are getting super rich either. Um, but in terms of collecting, when you can see an artwork you love and you see it at three in the morning and you can click a button, and collect it it's really great it's really fun so it works well for everybody the artist wakes up and they have money in their crypto wallet and you have a new art wakes up and says wait i bought that <laughs> yeah and, and, uh, sometimes it's so it's like amazon you know if you uh like shop on amazon at three in the morning sometimes you buy more than you intended so i definitely maybe have have over collected sometimes at odd hours but um it's a pleasurable way to collect you directly support artists, you communicate with them directly. It's so easy and frictionless to add things to your collection. And then you see them all online, you click on your OpenSea profile, you can see everything all together. So I think it's actually a really wonderful situation for collectors who are interested in collecting digital artwork. So 
Can yeah. I actually jump in on that, Brian? I was going to ask you to jump in on that. So. <laughs> um, so I, and like the, the fact that you described it as frictionless is so interesting because of course I think the entire ideology of the blockchain is precisely about this sort of frictionless exchange. Um, but I, I think that actually a little bit of friction is a good thing for art collecting. Um, so uh, it's also interesting to me that you compared it to shopping on Amazon. Um, and so what are the ways in which collecting art uh, should not be like shopping on Amazon, right? And obviously it's great for artists. As you said, you can get paid immediately. I know that you know when you've written about um, the utility of NFTs for or the appeal of NFTs for artists and you've talked about the frustration with like not getting paid on time. And of course the blockchain like makes all of that go away and that's fantastic. But um, in terms of building collections long-term, I mean, traditionally ownership implies stewardship and it implies that one is taking care of this asset for the future, this concept of, of like of custodial care. Um, and this is something that, you know, is a, a important to, you know, I get it. Like, I'm, I'm obviously like, obviously, I would say that because I work at an institution, I'm a museum curator, and I'm building a collection that we hold in public trust for the future. Um, but I've also been in lots of conversations with digital art curators, people like Regina Harsanyi, who have taught me so much about what conservation of digital assets means, um, especially when it comes to blockchain. And I just think that we need to sort of slow down a little bit and think, okay, well, it's obviously great for artists, but what does it mean for the long-term future of digital art that now we have all of these digital artworks circulating, you know, without friction um, on, on, you know, online um, and what are the potential pitfalls and dangers there? So I don't want to get too lost in the weeds, but essentially um, it's, <laughs> I just want to be clear for the for, for people who are listening, because looking at the q and I can see that there's some people attending who really, I think this might be the first time you're joining this conversation about NFTs. So the NFT is not the artwork itself, and the artwork itself almost never actually exists on the blockchain. So the NFT is just um, a, a kind of digital record that, let's say, points to the digital asset, which exists somewhere else in most cases, not all, but in most cases. So uh, the NFT is not an archival medium. It's not a way for storing digital assets. Um, it's basically just a way for um, monetizing them. And so it doesn't really solve any questions about, well, how do we you know, uh, uh, achieve long-term um, care of digital assets um, in, according to like industry-wide best practices? And in fact, I think it raises more problems um, because, for example, there is this big question around what you actually acquire when you acquire the NFT. So, again, this is not universally the case, but most of the major NFT platforms, their terms and conditions explicitly stipulate that when you buy the NFT, you are not, in fact, acquiring legal ownership over the associated asset. It's very explicit. It says you do not you know, own the asset. You only own the NFT. But of course, people are treating these NFTs as if they are sort of buying and selling works of art and not just the NFT tokens that point to those works of art. So I guess my question is, is who then becomes responsible for the conservation of that asset? Normally, when an artist sells a work of art, that responsibility transfers to the buyer, to the collector. But if the work of art, if the ownership is not actually transferring to the to the collector of the NFT, and in fact, the asset itself oftentimes doesn't transfer to the collector. I've heard from a lot of collectors who say that they don't even bother downloading the assets that they've, you know, supposedly bought with these NFTs because it's freely available on the internet and whatever, you know. Um, the NFT seems to be sort of more important to a lot of them than the artwork itself. So if you're not, you know, um, if the collector isn't downloading the asset and making a commitment to care for the asset, then who has that responsibility? And I think that, you know, by default, we might, you know, want to say, oh, well, it must be uh, the platform itself, because we're so used to platforms like Facebook storing our JPEGs for us, right? But if you go and look at the terms and conditions of these platforms, they also say that they explicitly are non-custodial, meaning they take, they assert no legal claim of ownership over your asset, which sounds like a great thing. Uh, but on the other hand, what that also means is that they don't assume any responsibility um, for caring for that asset either. So it, it just creates a really murky situation. And, 
you know, what, who ultimately will be responsible. And so yeah, can I respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. One is there is actually no legal standing for anything on the blockchain at this point. No government recognizes cryptocurrency. So you are in an outlaw space. Like you can do what you want. You can write a contract that says anything. It's kind of an honor system. There's nobody running this shop. There's no sheriff, um, as the collectors pointed out to me. There's nobody you can even call for a help desk. If you lose your phone, for example, one of them describes having their phone stolen and worrying that they lost all their assets. You mentioned collectors who don't download their assets. If you don't download your assets, you do not own them. If you're not storing them and you're not archiving them, you don't own them. You just have a piece of paper. You could very well go back to the tag that your NFT points to in a year and discover that you don't have anything. You have empty internet space and that happens to people. So there are lots of frictions in this space. Another friction that people don't like to talk about, but it's the biggest friction is because only two of the cryptocurrencies right now are treated as currency. So that when you cash out on those, you still pay taxes, but you're paying on a currency trading profit, basically. Other coin, including coin that might be more ecologically friendly, um, because we know that Ethereum runs on proof of work and there are others that are running on proof of stake like Tezos that have a much smaller footprint. However, those are currently treated as securities. So if you cash out on those, you actually pay a higher percentage. Now, I think this is a big reason why a lot of these sales have gone to charity. Also, because there's a whole other aspect where, you know, oh, where are you getting this money? You're doing currency speculation using the Internet, right? Like the government doesn't like this stuff. Neither do other countries' governments. So you have to understand what you're dealing with. It is not a secure platform that is defensible. It's not FDIC backed like a bank, right? It is. If you lose your money, you lost your money. So I think people can do it, but they just need to understand that it's totally caveat emptor here. And then another thing is it does cost some money to mint your NFT. So if you're an artist who doesn't sell work for a lot of money, you got to factor in that you're going to pay $150 to $200 just to mint each of your NFTs. So factor that in. It's not so easy. It is easier than getting signed with a gallery, but it's not easier than selling your work on Etsy. And I think to another of Tina's points, and this is sort of where I'll close, is um, what we're really seeing that's really meaningful here most of all is that people are getting comfortable with the idea of buying art online. It started happening in the past with places like Saatchi Art and Artsy, you know, and it's grown now partly because we didn't have art fairs for a year and a half. This is a big reason why people are considering this as a possible space for collecting because they do like shopping for art. And frankly, art collecting often is shopping. It's competitive shopping. And I'm okay with that. I actually don't have an issue with that. Um, I am concerned about artists being encouraged to invest in a risky financial instrument by collectors who are a lot more financially secure than the artists are and have a lot more to gain. That would be a concern that I have. All right, yeah, those are really great points to keep in mind. Um, it's almost 10 to 8, so I want to move to questions from the audience. Uh, one question that has come up a couple times is the environmental impact of NFTs. Um, none of the panelists have really done direct research on this topic, so I did round up. Well, okay, I don't know. This, maybe you can speak about it. I, was just I can speak too quickly. That, um, there are options. As I said, Bitcoin, Ethereum are on proof of work, which is a high energy intensive way of mining currency. Yeah. But if you're concerned about this, Tezos is a platform that is proof of stake. There are others. Algorand is another platform. Artists are exploring those right now. I think Hick at Nunk is a site that runs on Tezos where you can mint yeah. NFTs currently. Um, and so there's definitely options out there. You just have to do your homework. Uh, Ethereum claims it's going to move to proof of stake at some point, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So those people who are invested in Ethereum often say, oh, don't worry about it. They're going to fix that. It's really not as easy as it sounds. So if that's something you're really concerned about, you could work with these other platforms. Just keep in mind that right now the profits are mostly in the Ethereum platforms. Yeah. I was just going to say there are some links um, on the event page uh, for people who want to learn more about this topic. Um, does anyone else want to speak on it now? We have a link to um, how to mint on Hick at Nunk and get Tezos on that. Can I, can I bring something up about the um, the upfront costs? Um, Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, but o OpenSea allows you to 
not pay your minting charge until after the sale goes through. So they do lazy minting. So it, they mint and they charge you afterwards. So you're not paying to mint. In addition, you're just as people buy it, you're paying as you go. Um, on on the on the um, on the website, there is um, we have a, a document that we've been working on that basically analyzes um, as you know not all of the platforms, but as many as we've been getting through. That kind of tells you about the different um, the different blockchains that they're on, um, the different percentages that they have. Um, you know how they're minting, what's happening, where their storage is, because they all store in different places. You know, we we did a, a project recently, and you know, it was through some another artist friend of ours, and you know, that's all stored on the Amazon servers, and then you know, um, some people it's ISP and and uh, Anna and Tina and <laughs> what IPFS. Is, what's, what's it called IPFS. IPSS. Interplanetary file system. Yeah, so it, and that has its weird Everyone glitches wants. too. So it's like it is it is pretty insane. But I do want to say that, you know, just going really quick back to, you know, it is something where you've got to get in, into in a in a way. And when we were invited to to do our NFT on Super Rare, we really were very skeptical about it. And one of my main reasons for wanting to do it is our, our partners, Verisart, the people who we do the blockchain COAs with, they wanted to get into it and they're friends. And we, we kind of thought, well, we'll hold hands and we'll do this together with 10 other artists. And we did. And for me, it was an it was a, a realm in which I could embed our, our blockchain COAs into our metadata of this piece because it's, um, I, I feel it that's really important, especially with NFTs, because people are doing things like taking a picture of the poster that you made, making an NFT of it and selling it. And so there's that sort of thing going on. But um, but super rare and not super rare, but um, Verisart paid for our minting costs because I didn't have any Ethereum to actually go and, and uh, pay for the minting costs. So that is something that is... Uh, that that's been a big barrier to entry for a lot of of up and coming artists, people just getting into this space. So, and and I mean, my last thing on on that, I, you know, one thing that's a weird thing that a lot of the platforms are doing now is they're they're trying to get r lay people into the marketplace by having a Stripe account so you can pay with your credit card. So that's something that's that's something that we're grappling with is bringing people in who are not crypto rich and that are spending their hard earned money that they made from their job on, 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 um, crypto art. So anyway, I mean, there's so many avenues, but I, there are so many wonderful links in, in the, um, on the website that, um, I, I really would say to any young artist or old artist or any type of artist who's wanting to get into this, research them there's so many there's so many great links and links within those links thanks um amanda so there are several questions in the q a um that are bringing up this question about rights like what does it mean to own the nft and own the work tina has addressed that a bit already but tina maybe you could respond to some of the specific questions that uh people are asking and expand on what you said before I'll do my best with the caveat that like I'm not a lawyer, but um, just so that we should understand that, you know, when artists sell their work, um, generally speaking, they always retain copyright. So even if you sold your work, um, you know, to the museum, uh, we would physically take ownership of um, the, the artwork itself. Um, even if it's digital, we would take ownership over the artwork, but you would retain the copyright, meaning that you as the artist um, we would have control over um, where and when that work was reproduced, for example. So we wouldn't be able to further commercialize or profit from the image of your artwork, but we would uh, you know, have the authority to decide when and where the physical object would be exhibited, for example. And these are rights that, you know, they obviously have to be encoded in a kind of contract. And so um, the, and, and to um, Arnada's point, like 
the so much about what's going on with this NFT space. Like, yes, we use terms like smart contracts, but to my understanding, I've heard it said again and again, um, smart contracts that have not yet been tested in a court of law. Nobody knows if they're legally enforceable. And all of this stuff is going to have to sort of get worked out um, in the coming months. But I think that um, uh, right now, as it stands, the NFT is itself neither necessary nor sufficient to grant the traditional kinds of rights that collectors want to see when they're buying a work of art. So for example, the right of exhibition, like when a museum buys a work of art, we want to have certain rights. Like we want to know that we're acquiring certain rights with that work, even if it's not the copyright, there are other rights that come with that. Um, and so, um, you know, you need to have, a, I think always a separate contract, a separate, um, a legal document that actually is enforceable writing on top of the NFT. Otherwise the NFT is meaningless. And so I just want to Shout out actually um, this this show that's up right now called Pieces of Me, which was co-presented by um, Transfer Gallery and Left Gallery, who are real pioneers in the space of digital art. Um, and actually, um, I've learned so much from talking um, to them over the past few months. Um, and uh, this and I exhibition break in Tina just to mention that I know museums yeah. have a really different needs with their artwork than individuals. So just because I know someone asked that question, yeah. and probably their answer, they needed probably a less sophisticated answer than what you gave. When you buy an NFT, Fair. you don't get any rights is the really short, easy answer. You get the right to resell yeah. the piece and that's all you get. Well, you um, get the right to resell the NFT. So you're not negotiating for right to sell it. You don't have the right to make a print. You don't have the right to sell a video of the piece. You only have the right to resell it. I just want to make sure that that's clear because I think for the average collector, not a museum, it's simpler. Yeah. Um, fair point, simple. fair point. Um, but I guess the, yeah. my larger point is that like the, <laughs> the, what exactly the rights are that are being transferred is still so murky because we're talking, we're both sort of invoking. No the, rights like, are being transferred. No rights, are, except for the fact that many artists now are trying to write their own contracts yeah. and are trying to write their own smart contract. But I think that's the, the direction things are moving nothing. in. The default is nothing. The default is nothing. And so I wanted I think to speak to that a little bit too around um, actually some of the things that artists think they can code into smart contracts in law when it's been coded in, it sometimes hasn't been enforceable. So I was doing some research and there's a great book for people who might be interested in this historically by the art historian and lawyer, Joan Key, um, called Models of Integrity, Art and Law in 1960s. It's really great. Um, but she talks about how um, Seth Siegelob created in 1976, um, the Artist Reserve Rights Transfer Agreement, I'm sorry, 1971, um, as an outgrowth of the um, MoMA strike of 1970 and a way to try to create a standard contract that artists could put forward to protect and defend their rights and include resale, included other kinds of protections that would serve the artist. Um, and that ended up being fairly unenforceable because generally speaking, the courts would side with collectors. Once you own an object, by and large, the court would find that it was yours to do anything you wanted with. So like in response to the question about the Basquiat drawing NFT and the probability of the buyer destroying the NFT drawing that really, I mean, in some ways the law already gives you the right to do that if you own a Basquiat drawing, unless the estate intervenes, which it did in this case. Um, and I just want to point out another thing that, that Joan Key talks about is actually how the 1976 California Resale Royalty Act, which is enshrined into state law, uh, was overturned in 2012 by the Supreme Court because of language that suggested California might be trying to legislate art sales that were taking place outside the state of California that would be a violation of the Interstate Commerce Clause. So there's things that artists are trying to do in smart contracts that they don't understand that even with legislation, like unless it's federal legislation, those smart contracts may not be enforceable in terms of getting you your royalties or governing how the artwork can be treated or say, you know, another dream we have, say, in the decolonize this place kind of spaces that you could say present your artwork from being bought by someone like a Warren Canders, you know, or someone with ties to Jeffrey Epstein. Right. So that's another question is, you know, really how enforceable is any of that if it's not agreed upon by all parties involved? So just to bring this back to art for a quick second, because I didn't get to finish my thought earlier. So I was about to say this exhibition pieces of me, um, I think is a really smart exhibition because it's 
thematizes these issues. It's called Pieces of Me because it's precisely about the question of what exactly is being given when an artist sells a work via NFT to somebody, right? What piece of me, what piece of my process, what piece of my oeuvre is actually being given, what rights are being given. And also this exhibition is one of the first ones, although also a uh, feral file, which is another NFT sort of, uh, or yeah, NFT not exclusive now, NFT, but NFT other platforms. Now open tonight. Uh, your show opening tonight, but more and more of um, the sort of uh, critically framed and curated exhibitions are tackling exactly this question. Um, and, and I know that Left Gallery and Transfer Gallery have been working very hard to try to write new contracts and to think about how one could operate in this space in a way that does consider custodianship and is sort of like ethical as well. So just leave it at that. Um, there's an interesting question from someone who's working on a uh, touring group exhibition and wondering if there are other examples of um, group exhibitions and like collections of NFTs versus individual drops. I think pieces of me and Feral File are both uh, good examples of, of shows. Um, Anurada, I think you've t spoken to a curator who's, who's dealing with this issue as well. Yeah, um, so I spoke with a curator who is planning to do an NFT based on a virtual uh, 3D modeled exhibition that he organized with a number of artists. And he doesn't want to be in the position of minting NFTs of other artists' works and therefore potentially infringing on their copyright. So he feels more comfortable minting a collective NFT where the exhibition as a 3D model that you can enter into and experience the works in situ is legitimate as his intellectual property. Um, and there's he's creating agreements with the artists involved in the show I, for whatever, however this works. I can't tell you how that works, but um, that I think is between you and your artists. It's definitely happening though, and I think it is happening particularly if it's a nonprofit or non-commercial entity that wants to use the NFT to generate some funds, um, but they're not actually representing artists in the marketplace. Um, there's another question about uh, how, you know, the conversation has been about the market, rights, and so on, and we're not really talking about the content of the art. Um, I feel like that's a huge discussion because any kind of art can be minted as an NFT. Uh, Rhizome, which is a new media arts organization in New York, had a, had a really interesting panel yesterday. Um, called NFT Aesthetics, I think, uh, where they had like several artists talking about how they approach the space, the kind of work they do. So I would, um, I don't know if it's online yet, but I would definitely recommend um, trying to look that up. Um, and it's something that is sort of, a question that's close to my heart too, because I, I have also try, been trying to write about uh, the different kinds of work that have been, um, you know, being produced in this space. So I guess just like Google me, on Art in America, and you'll find some, some more discussions can of I, that. Can I speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Because I think that is an issue. There's so much out there. You look and a lot of it looks crazy or kitschy or like sci-fi illustration. And I think it's really important to know that there is a lot of fantastic artwork that is being minted as NFTs. And it's not just artists, old artwork that they're scanning in and putting off as NFTs, but really um, artwork that's sensitive to this new technology and new medium. And not to be totally self-promotional, but I just curated a show that attempts to show this called NFT Now. And if you go to nftnowshow.com, you can see it in its 3D glory in the Kunst Matrix art space. And each of the works has a whole textual description as well. And the idea is it's not comprehensive or historical overview, but just what's going on now with really interesting artists creating high quality work. Um, almost half the artists are women. They're um, international artists from all over the globe and addressing a whole range of issues but sensitive to the blockchain that they're on. So I think looking through shows like that or other ones that are going on are heartening. And you can see that there's just really fabulous stuff out there and artists taking advantage of this new technology and kind of medium as well. All right, so it's uh, past eight o'clock. Um, I think that's a nice note to end on, but if anyone else has some final thoughts you'd like to share, uh, Shepard? Yeah, I, I mean, since Ann, Ann and I are, are, are active artists, I think um, that is the one part that we're not, we haven't really been talking a lot about. What I see as exciting about the NFT is to be able to do things that 
don't translate, um, that I can't do with a screen print or a mixed media painting. Um, and so, you know, my, my first NFT was taking a mural piece and evolving it to add some new, some new imagery so that it was unique. But then it's a video pan around the piece like I'd hope the viewer would experience a mural in person where they'd see the entire thing and then look at details. Um, and I wanted it to have a little bit of a cinematic quality, but then I thought, yeah, that was, that was a little bit special, but really underutilizing what is possible with this medium. So then when the hip hop producer and, and multi-instrumentalist Mike Dean approached me about doing a collaboration, it immediately occurred to me that I love music. I love, I love film. I love motion. Um, and you know, and then I have my, my 2d graphic aesthetic. How can all those things come together in a way that I can't, um, you know, I, I, I can't provide in a lot of other contexts. So, um, sure. I can make a promo video for one of his songs, but that might be really expensive and who knows whether it's possible to quantify how it helped his album sales, what he should, uh, compensate me for, for the two of us knowing that we could just work on this thing and make an NFT and, um, and publish it ourselves without having to look at sort of it being an ancillary part of an, uh, you know, a, of another initiative. It was, um, it was really exciting. And so doing, doing animation, creating the original design work, pairing that with music, you know, that it has the multi-sensory possibility. And I've seen a lot of artists do that. And then there is plenty of potential for kitschy things. I think every artist has got to find the way to be authentic to their voice, but also maybe push the boundaries of what they've been doing, knowing that there are more possibilities with, um, with a purely digital work. So yeah, I think, I think artists should just think in, in innovative ways and look at that as the added value. Like why make an NFT? That's why. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Amanda, do you have any final parting thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, you know, what what I, what I think, you know, when when collectors are buying the work, and I'm not talking about the $69 million people sale, but in the normal space where people are spending, you know, I don't know, I mean, a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars to to buy these artists' works, I I think and I feel from my experience so far with other collectors is that they're excited to be transferring that and ha to the artist and having something from the artist and I think that's that's um that's the kind of I guess collector and like artist takeaway is that I think that in the in the you know the typical sense of what's going on with um NFTs right now I think that's the I just holding to that spirit of that of, of that that's what's happening is important and um yeah that's um that's what draw me to draw drew me into nfts and that artists can you know um just hopefully be thought of first in this transaction great uh tina yeah actually feeding directly off that um you know, one of the things I thought was such a great point when when I sort of was realizing that actually, as Anne said, no rights are given um, to the artwork itself when you're buying an NFT on most NFT art platforms. It was Wade Wallerstein of um, Silicon Valley who pointed out that this is actually in a way a great thing for artists because it allows them to raise money while still retaining ownership of all of their art. Um, and in fact, the NFT art platforms explicitly say that the, the artist has the right to then go sell that exact same work to somebody else as long as they don't tokenize it. So um, I just wanted to point that out. And then sort of as a final thought, uh, I, I want to say that my hope, um, you know, after all of, you know, sort of the dust settles a little bit, what I hope will happen is that there will be more excitement and energy and focus on the field of digital art and thinking about that as a really valid contemporary art form. Um, and also thinking about a lot of excitement and energy and focus on thinking about how can we support artists better? And you know, right now, okay, the NFT seems like it's one option, but what else can we do as a society? Like, I don't know, UBI and universal healthcare or like lifetime artist pensions, like they have in Iceland. Like what are other things that we as a society can be doing to support our artists that don't rely on uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain?
Thanks, uh, Anuradha. Thank you. So um, I will say that the collectors in the NFT space that I've spoken to are a younger and more diverse group. Um, than we often find in the traditional art world. So in that sense, there is more diversity coming in. I do think of it as more of an IPO for the artwork or even the artist. Um, and definitely that was true for the David Hansen NFT that uh, they treated it a bit like a venture capital round for the robotics company for which you know $700,000 is actually not that much money. They're gonna have to do a bunch more. Um, and that I do think that the artists who make the most money are usually the same kind of artist or profile of artist that the market's already elevating. So it's not necessarily the NFT space's fault if that's not a very diverse group. Um, but I do also wanna say, because I've heard this in the, in the comments, um, collectors are doing it as an investment, but they really do enjoy the artwork. And a lot of times traditional art collectors are doing it as an investment too. They really do enjoy the artwork and they wanna build often virtual display spaces like Anne has done, um, or even in some of these uh, three-dimensional blockchain-based platforms to display and share not only the artwork that they own as NFTs, but other artworks as well. Great, uh, Anne, last word. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief. I think uh, just maybe because of my experience as an educator or um, you know, artists and collectors, seeing new people come into the space, both artists and collectors, and being so enthusiastic about the visual world. So seeing people make artwork who didn't think of themselves as artists and suddenly they're selling work. And my Twitter feed is full of people saying, I quit my job, I'm going freelance, I paid off my parents' mortgage, I got out of student debt and I started saving them. They're, they're so kind of joyful to read and connecting with collectors who have bought my NFTs and following them on Twitter. They love collecting this artwork. They are really into it. They love supporting the artists and being part of the community. And it's just great to see maybe how many people would collect art if it were easier to collect art. It might not be good to think of it as Amazon, but it might be good to have it be easier than it is now, then bring more people into it. So I think it's positive and as much as more people should participate in creating visual things and collecting visual things and enjoying the visual world. Great, um, thanks Anna, thanks everyone so much for this great conversation. I'm going to ask uh, Donald to say a few uh, words of farewell and, and thanks again to everyone who, who came and listened to us. Good night. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And I, I hope all of you have enjoyed the interesting and very informative discussions as much as I have. Uh, thank you once again, Brian, uh, for moderating tonight's discussion and big thanks to all our panelists for sharing your time and expertise with our RISD community. Uh, I also like to thank the over 400 participants for joining us uh, today. And we will be posting the recording of tonight's sessions on our website uh, where you all can uh, find more events like this and additional ways to engage with the RISD community. And I look forward to seeing all of you in future RISD events. And uh, last but not least, uh, thank you to the RISD School Campus team for the coordination and making this uh, webinar possible. Again, thanks everybody. Good night. <laughs>